key to a glass hatch in the floor. Through the window, a chair could be seen below, vaulted inside an enclosed undercarriage canopy. A weapon with a large conical dish was wrapped in front of the seat. That's another LRAD cannon, isn't it? Jason asked. Stella nodded. You could also swap it out for a machine gun, if need be. Once we're beyond the buffer zone, Harrington warned, we may need both to protect and lift if we run into any serious trouble. Trouble? Why? Out the windows ahead of them, the world was pitch black. Behind the gondola, the station's lamp-lit bulkheads continued to recede into the darkness, reflected in the boiling lake. Then the tracks followed a bend in the cavernous tunnel, and even that last light vanished. Harrington stepped to a cabinet and opened a door. From hooks inside hung a row of heavy goggles, night vision gear. What is on? I'm going to extinguish our cabin lights before we attract any attention. Then I'll ignite on exterior infrared lamps. Gray tucked the gear over his eyes as Harrington doused the lights inside the gondola. His goggles picked up the small specks of light. Diodes on the conveyor's control panel, but beyond the windows the world remained dark. In this sunless, moonless underworld, even night vision was useless. Then the professor kicked on the exterior lamps, and beams of infrared penetrated that endless darkness. Though the wavelength was invisible to the naked eye, the goggles turned those beams into the brightest spotlights, illuminating what the darkness had hid a moment ago. Gray gaped as the view opened ahead of him. Kowalski simply shook his head. Something tells me we're going to need bigger guns. 1214 p.m. Jason pressed his palms against the glass taking in the sights as the armored gondola slowly rode its rails across the roof of this new world. Have you ever seen anything like this? Stella asked. No, not like this. The cavernous tunnel was tall enough to hold the Statue of Liberty without her torch ever scraping the rows of stalactites that hung from the roof like jagged fangs. Below, the snaking river slowly churned fogged and steep. All around the gondola, a forest of massive columns formed a maze. As their cage passed one, Jason noted stone branches jutting up from the pillar and joining the roof like support buttresses. Up close, the pillar's rough surface appeared strangely corrugated, almost like bark. Then he looked even closer. It is bark, he suddenly realized aloud glancing back as the column proceeded behind him. We are moving through a petrified forest, Stella said. Remnants of a lost time when Antarctica was green and lush with life. They're glossopterous, semi-tropical trees, Harrington said. Over the past decades, archaeologists have uncovered three such ancient forests on the surface of the continent. Massive, petrified stumps with scatters of fossilized leaves around them. But nothing as well preserved as down here, Stella added, 